All right, this brings us into chapter 11. And on the schedule, it says we're going to do chapter 11 and chapter 12. Um, we may get a little bit of chapter 12 um, at the very, very end, but chapter 11 is going to be like the big meat of the rest of the semester. The stuff, the major stuff that you're going to be quizzed and examined on, examined on is uh, chapter 11. So that's what we're going to work on today. I'm thinking we'll see how much we get through today. We may or may not have a quiz next Monday because if we don't have much to, new stuff, there's not much sense in doing a quiz on um, on Monday. And then we can do one the following Monday and the Monday after that and still have uh, plenty, I think. Yeah. All right. So this, again, is going to be a little bit different, kind of like with nuclear chemistry. It's kind of removed from what we've been talking about in all the other stuff so far. Uh, there aren't going to be any calculations involved in this chapter. Um, and you'll see this if you go on and take more chemistry, if you end up in a full semester organic chemistry class, same kind of thing. It's very different from the other kinds of chemistry. There's no calculations. Um, it's all like pictures and manipulating shapes in your head and that kind of stuff. So some people really take to that a lot more than the other kind of chemistry and other people don't like it and would rather just do the equations and the regular stuff. So it'll be kind of fun to see where you come out on that. Um, does anybody know what we talk about, what we mean when we say organic chemistry, what that is? Have you heard of it before? Yeah, so it's chemistry based on carbon. Um, and we can even be a little bit more specific than that. We'll make carbon the most important. It's actually, there's lots of different atoms that take place in organic chemistry, but most of these molecules are going to be made from carbon and, and mainly a couple other molecules, a couple other atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. So, where that word comes from, organic chemistry, organic means having to do with life, having to do with organisms. And it was thought for a really long time that the world of living things and the world of non-living things, rocks and whatever, were totally separate and they were different types of compounds. And things that you dug out of the ground or that you found in rocks or whatever were completely separate because anything that any molecule that was made from a, a living thing was made using a type of a like a life force kind of thing that could never be made synthetically. And now, of course, we know that's not true. You can put the atoms together. You can make whatever kind of molecules you want. Um, but that's where that split was initially, that you had inorganic chemistry, which was like minerals and stuff. And then you had organic chemistry, which all came from living things. And now we know that that's not really like clearly different categories, but it's still a branch of chemistry dealing with molecules made from carbon. And the importance of this, the reason it's kind of its own thing, these molecules are often similar. To those found in living things. And that's why this chemistry can be so important. So if you want to make a molecule that interacts with a living thing in a predictable way, you're going to use organic chemistry because you want to make the same types of molecules that something that will be like the molecules that are already in a body. So if you want to make drugs, uh, materials, things like that that go in a body, that mess with the body, then you're looking at organic chemistry. All right, so what we're going to do in this class uh, is obviously a huge branch of chemistry that you can study for years and years. We're going to look at some of the basics of it and what are some of the underlying principles that, that apply to organic compounds that don't really apply to some of the other ones and, um, and what kind of makes it special. And we'll get a little sense of the reactions and the way that things can be really carefully controlled in organic chemistry. All right, so if we're going to talk about carbon-based compounds, let's look at... Uh, carbon 
and how it usually bonds. So we'll go back to whatever, a few chapters ago. How many valence electrons does carbon have? It's good, everybody's looking at the periodic table. Four, yeah. So it's got these four uh, valence electrons, which means if it wants to make covalent bonds, how many covalent bonds can it make? Also four, because we know that it wants to have eight. So these four electrons mean that there's like four holes here that can bond to other things, you know, ways it can connect to other things. So a large part of what we call organic chemistry comes down to this idea that carbon wants to have four bonds. And so, so it's going to make compounds like this, or maybe things like this. We can make some double bonds. We talked a little bit about those before. But carbon always has four. And that kind of predictability, it has a lot to do with why organic chemistry works so well. All right, so we write those compounds like this. We write them, you know, kind of flat like that. We skipped the part a while ago where we talked about shapes, but now we're going to come back and talk about what are the actual sh what's the actual shape of that thing. Um, so to show you that, I'm gonna open this program so we can see it because it's it's kind of a tricky shape to look at. Um, I'm gonna draw that molecule right here, and as I draw it, it's gonna try to figure it out in the other screen here. So there's my carbon with four hydrogens coming off of it. And here's what it looks like now in three dimensions. Does everybody see that? It's not flat, right? It's sort of like a, well, how would you describe that shape? A what? Like a jack? Yeah, yeah, sure, like a jack, exactly, yeah. Does everybody play a lot of jacks? Is that like a... Is that a popular thing? Yeah. Well, you're not like 100 years old. <laughs> Jack's been around for a long time. <laughs> right? I mean, Jack's are, they got to be at least 100 years old, right? I don't know. I like speculating on things I just don't know anything about. Um, all right. So anyway, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good descriptor of that shape. How else would you describe that shape? Or how else could you describe that shape? What? Like a, like a tripod with a stand holding something up. Yeah, kind of a triangle. So you can see the, it's kind of a, got these triangular faces. And one thing to notice is that it's regular all the way around. So everything is evenly spaced out. So when you say it's a tripod with something else, that's true. But there isn't a specific base because anything else could also be that base if we flip it around. Okay. All right, so let me um, get this into a particular... Um, spot here, and then I'm going to copy it into the notes so we can draw on it. All right, there's our carbon atom. Our, um, our molecule. This molecule is called methane. It's one carbon with four hydrogens, so CH4. Not, not really. A little better. CH4, methane. And um, the carbon atom is in the middle here, and that means these are all hydrogens. And what happens when we want to draw this kind of a shape on paper or on, on a screen where we don't have three dimensions, we're not rotating things? So we have to use some special notation to show this. One way that we do that is we say that this bond here and this one here are in the same plane of the screen or your paper. 
But the other two are not. One of them's coming out at you, and one of them's going back behind. You see that? How one of them's kind of more coming out, one of them's going back behind? The symbols we use for that is we use this wedge shape, and we call it a wedge, to show the one coming out. And then we use these dashes to show the one going back behind. And that's a way that we can show this three-dimensional structure in two dimensions. So when we draw this, if we really wanted to express that shape, one way we could do that is like this. And this particular shape is called tetra Hedral. And the reason for that name is that if you connect all the hydrogens together, if you imagine the whole shape, they're not bound, they're not bonded together. It's not chemical bonds. But we're just like imagining a shape that has that's kind of like this. Then it would have a, a line back here and there. It's like a pyramid with a triangular base. That type of a shape is called a tetrahedron. Go back to your old geometry notes or something. Um, but that, that, or you can just take my word for it. That's called the tetrahedron. It's a regular solid, which means it has all the same faces, all the same sides, all the same vertices, all the same angles, all that stuff. Um, and that's where that word tetrahedral comes from. So if you imagine the carbon in the middle of the tetrahedron and the hydrogens on each corner, on each um, vertex, then you'd have, have that shape. That's where that shape comes from. So it's symmetric. It's even. And this shape is really important to how uh, compounds of carbon end up being built and how they end up looking. So if we look at... A larger molecule like this one, this is called propane. We'll get into this, the names and things in a minute. We might draw it like that, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't really show the three dimensional shape of that molecule because we know that the angles have to be this tetrahedral angle. And in fact, if we wanted to know that angle, the angle between any two bonds here is about 110 degrees. So the reason it's not flat is because if it were flat and T-shaped, what would the angle be? 90, right? And 110 is bigger than 90. So that means that those big hydrogen electrons can be further away from each other if they're in this shape rather than being flat. If they're flat, they have to be squeezed closer together. So the way I've drawn it here, we've got 90 degree bond angles. And that's OK. This is a depiction of the, how it's connected. Um, but in three dimensions, that's not really what that would look like. If we wanted to show it in a more three dimensional way, we would draw it kind of bent like this. And if we keep that central chain in the plane of the board, that means those other hydrogens coming off of the uh, carbons are coming out at us and going away from us. So we can use this dash wedge notation to show that there's a hydrogen coming out and a hydrogen going back on each of these carbons. And that's, that's a structure that shows us the three-dimensional um, position of those atoms, or relative position of those atoms. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to learn some of the names of these, um, these structures. And we're going to learn how to draw them in a few different ways. These molecules all fall under the category of alkanes. Alkanes are molecules made from only carbon and hydrogen with only single bonds.
And we're going to put a couple headings here for our structures. So we'll have the name, the formula, um, and we're going to have a couple different types of structures that we're going to draw. We're going to leave the three-dimensional stuff alone a little bit now and look at a couple other ways that people draw these structures. So the first thing that we're going to look at, we'll call the expanded structure, which is sometimes called, yeah, we don't put that down there. It's called the Lewis structure. This is like what we drew before with all the bobs where you just draw everything. And then we'll look at a couple others too, but we, we can't look at the others until we get a little higher up in our, our numbers. So our first one that we're looking at is called methane. The formula is CH4, and the expanded structure looks like that. So you've got the carbon with four hydrogens connected around it. Um, you can draw it in a three-dimensional way. You can draw it in that way. Either way is considered an expanded structure. All right, let's move on then to the next one, which is ethane. So you, all you do is you drop that M and you've got ethane. And now we've got C2H6. The expanded structure looks like this. So we've got two carbons, and each one needs four bonds. And now we can add another column. We can look at what we call the condensed structure. As you'll see when we start drawing more of these, it becomes pretty tedious to draw all these hydrogens out all the time. We get to four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. That's a lot of hydrogens to draw all over the place. So we come up with ways to abbreviate them. And one way is by condensing those hydrogens onto the carbons that they are connected to. So instead of writing everything out, we could write this structure as just CH3, CH3. Each carbon in the expanded structure has three hydrogens. So another way to write that is just like this. And that's a whole lot easier and quicker than this, but it means the same thing. For more complicated structures, the other type of condensed structure that you're going to see is condensing the hydrogens in the same way, but also putting lines in between them, like that. It means the same thing. So that's another type of a condensed structure. A little bit bigger. At three carbons, we've got propane, C3H8. So now we've got three carbons in a row with eight hydrogens around them. And if we want to draw the condensed structure there, it would be CH3 and then CH2 and CH3 because the middle carbon only has two hydrogens on it. So CH3, CH2, CH3. Something that can be helpful if you have trouble seeing this or as we move to larger molecules, we'll do this a lot, is to number the carbons in the structure. So it doesn't really matter how you do it, but I'm just going to call that one, two, and three. Then when you move to a different style of structure, We can go one, two, and three and kind of keep track and make sure we've got everything connected to everything else in the right way. The next entry is called butane. And I'll give you a hand. It has four carbons. 
see if you can fill in the rest. So what you may want to do is draw the expanded structure first, then get the formula, and then look at the um, condensed structure. All right, so what'd you come up with for the formula? C4H10. C4H10. Okay, thanks. So you'll get C, 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 C. And you can see it's already getting pretty tedious to write all these hydrogens, right? So when we get up to 10, I think maybe after this one, we'll just stop it with the expanded structural formulas and stick to something a little bit um, easier. So again, a couple ways you can write this. You can go CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. That would be a condensed formula. Or you can leave the lines in there to show that uh, to show the connectivity or show, to, show, to show how they're connected. So you'd go CH3, CH2, CH2, and CH3. Right. Um, so as we'll see in a minute, when a structure is perfectly linear like that, it's easy. Either one, it doesn't really matter. When the structure branches off, it becomes a lot easier to use the lines rather than trying to figure that out. In a, yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to go on now to larger ones. But as we just said, writing this expanded structural formula all the time gets really tedious. So we're going to learn another <laughs> abbreviation. So this time, we're going to go name and then the formula part probably isn't as important now so we'll go name condensed formula and then we're going to learn a new one called a skeletal structure or a line structure So just to get used to this new format, let's redo the one we just did. So butane, our condensed structure is CH3. We're going to use the lines here just to make it clear. And then I'm going to show you the skeletal formula, and we'll try to figure out what we're doing there. So here's the what we call the skeletal formula for butane. That's it. So can you figure out what's going on there? Yeah, what? The points are the carbons, yeah. How do you know? Just because of the numbers? Yeah, exactly. So we've got four of these carbons, one, two, three, four. And four spots where the line changes or ends, whoops, on this structure, one, two, three, four. But do we have enough information with that skeletal structure? How do we know how many hydrogens there are if they're not shown? What? So like, how do you know how many? Yeah, but why? Why, why is that always true? You're right. OK, anybody else? Why is that always true? So like, if I just looked at this carbon in this structure, how do I know that there have to be two carbons, or two hydrogens on, uh, on that carbon? Yeah, because if we go way back up to our thing here, carbon always makes four bonds. 
So that's such a good rule. That's such a, a rule that works all the time. All right, if we're not going to show four bonds, we can just assume that the extra spots are taken up by hydrogen. And we can just always assume that. And then we don't need to show the hydrogens. We can assume that they're going to be taken up. So let's finish our, our thing so you can see a few different versions of this. And then we'll talk about the specific rules of how to draw those things properly. Um, so the next one in our, uh, in our list has five carbons, and that is pentane. And that's what its skeletal structure would look like. Kind of like an M or a W. Doesn't matter if you start up or down. And then I'm going to give you the names of the other ones, and you fill in the rest with the condensed structure and the skeletal structure. So after pentane, we've got hexane. Heptane, octane, nonane, and decane. So after four, after butane, the, it becomes a little bit more, uh, a little easier to predict how many carbons it's going to be because the prefix or the, the main part of the word there corresponds to a number, like pent is 5, hex is 6, hept is 7, oct is 8, non is 9, and dec is 10. It's just those first four that are a little bit weird with methane, ethane, propane, and butane. So those are just ones that you have to remember. Do this while you do it too. I guess something like that. I didn't fill in the middle ones, but you get the idea. Oh, I did not see if it was left. All right, let's get a little weirder.
we're going to find a new term called isomers. Isomers are molecules with the same molecular formula, but the atoms connected in a different way. So for example, butane we wrote as this but there's another way to write butane or there's another way to use that to those same materials it's not butane anymore and that is like this Each of those formulas, each of those molecules has the formula C4H10, but they are connected by in different ways. And this is why the molecular formula is not so useful in organic chemistry, because it doesn't tell us anything about how things are connected. So if we just say C4H10, that doesn't really give us enough information to tell us what the overall structure is. We really need a structural formula. We need something that tells us how things are connected. The condensed formula is one way to do that. The line structures would also work for this because this is what our skeletal formula is. That's what it would look like for this one. And this one would look like this. But the trickiest thing about isomers, especially with larger molecules, is how do we know if they're the same or they're different? So rules for drawing isomers. And then we're going to try with, with one of these larger ones. First, um, we're going to start with just the carbons. Two, we're going to do something, we're going to check the rotation. What that means is Single bonds can rotate. So if I draw something like this and that, these are the same. The reason I know them to be the same, if I number them, they're still connected in the same order. The only difference between those two structures is that I've kind of twisted one down. But because single bonds can rotate, that's OK. We can use whatever angles we want. How I would find an isomer is by disconnecting something and sticking it on somewhere else. And that's how we make sure that we have an, an actual isomer and not just a rotation, a rotomer, or a conformer. Um, so then the third one is. Don't leave your structures with just C's. We have to make sure all carbons have four bonds. So let's try to find isomers for pentane. I'll show you one. So the easiest one to find is always the one where they're just straight across.
and see if you can find two more isomers. So two other ways of arranging five carbons that, is, that are different from that. If you think you've got one, um, come put it up on the board here, and we'll talk about that. You can talk, talk in your groups, or just think about it. Let's see if we can find a couple of them. Did I find any yet? Want to draw another one? If you have anything that looks different from that, I'll put it up. It'll be good if we get a few different ones and then we can figure out, try to compare which ones are the same, which ones are different. What? Yeah, put it up. Maybe I'll have another one. Anything that looks different from either of these? Could be anything, anything looks different from those two. Same thing. Okay. All right. So we got a few. Um, so between those three and the one I've drawn up on the board, which ones are the same? Which ones are different? I'll give you a hint. 
there's, there's three total isomers of pentane. So among these four structures that have been drawn, two of them are the same. Anybody see which two are the same? What? The one up there or the one on top here? This one and this one? Yeah. Well, let's check them out. So this is an important thing to be able to do. How do you even go about evaluating them, whether or not they're the same? Um, I think the best way to do it is to use those numbers, the way we like numbered the carbons before. So I'm going to do mine here, and then we'll do the others on the board too. Um, so here I would go one, two, three, four, five. And there's no right or wrong way to number them. I'm just, we're just numbering. We're just giving them numbers for now. Um, so then for this one, I might say, okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five. And then one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And the reason that's helpful is because now we can say things like, okay, uh, in this structure, one is connected to two, but in this other structure, one is connected to three. So we know they're different, assuming we've numbered them somewhat similar. Uh, so for instance, I can see with this one, okay, there's three in a row, one, two, three, and then there's two more carbons coming off of number two. Four and five are connected and coming off of number two. In this one, I got one, two, three again, or I could even go one, two, three up here or something. But four and five are no longer connected to each other. See that? So that tells me that these are not the same. Because up here, four and five were connected together. Up here, they were not. And there's no official language for that. It's just however you can see yourself that things are connected differently up here than they were down here. When we get into the names next week, um, that'll make more sense too. So then what about this one? Is this the same as one of those other ones or up there? The same as the top one? How do you know? Yeah, they're all connected in a line. Now, this structure looks way different from that one because of the angles and everything else. But if we stick to and focus on which carbons are connected to which, we can see that this one is five carbons connected in a line, one after the other, just like the one up there is five carbons connected in a line, one after the other. So they end up being um, actually the same. So those are the three isomers then, this one, this one, and up there. And I'll draw them all up here. To have them in the notes. Uh, so the one that that's down here would look like this. Oh, they've got to come the other way, but that's okay. Same thing. And then the other one would look like this. So the next thing was going to be, let's put these in line structures. But since you already did, uh, I'll just draw them here. And the last thing we'll do today, let's, put, let's look at the actual formal rules for writing these skeletal structures or line structures, um, how they work and what you have to do. The reason uh, I use both those terms, I was taught that they were called line structures, so that's that keeps coming out of my mouth, but the book calls them skeletal structures, so that's I'm trying to go back and forth um, so we can use both those terms because they're both used. Okay, one. We're going to assume carbon atoms. at each end and place where the lines come together, which is called a vertex. 
So if you've got something like this, you've got carbons one, two, three, four, five. We've already kind of gone through that. So anytime the line changes direction, there's a carbon. Anytime there's an end of a line, there's a carbon. Um, common mistakes here are forgetting the beginning. So you go to draw a line structure, and you go one, two, three, four, five. But when we count this out, it's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, because we didn't count one when we put our pen down, and we counted one when we moved it. So that's a common mistake, to just be off by one. So it's always a good idea when you draw a structure to just re quickly recount and make sure you've got the right number of carbons. You can even number it if you want to. And then the other thing is when we start getting kind of stranger branching structures, make sure that you still maintain those good angles so you can always see which things are which. Um, so for instance, if you're going like this and you've got nice angles and then you kind of realize you want to go one more, you don't want to put it like that because there's, it's not clear that that's actually um, something different, right? So it's got to go down. In terms of angles, generally, if we draw something like this, if we're drawing other things branching off, we want to branch off with the widest angles possible. So that means we put the line here, not there. Okay. So if we wanted something branching off uh, this carbon right here, we wouldn't draw it like that. We would draw it like that to keep those angles all out and wide as possible. If you need to put two things, two different things on the same spot, you would put one kind of this way and one that way. So that way it keeps all the, the widest angles that we can. Keeps that nice tetrahedral shape. All right. So the second rule is that we always assume enough hydrogens. to fill four bonds to carbon. And so we're going to make sure that there are, every carbon always has four bonds. So we don't show any of the hydrogens that are connected to carbons. But we know they're there because we know carbon always has to have four bonds. So even if we have some kind of strange large structure, We can pick out any carbon in there and figure out how many hydrogens are supposed to be on it. Like right here, how many hydrogens should be on that carbon? Just one, because there's three bonds shown. So that means there's got to be one hydrogen. What about right there? How many hydrogens? Three. There's one bond shown, so we need three more hydrogens around to make four. What about down in here. Zero, yeah. Four bonds are shown on carbon. One, two, three, four. Those are all connecting to other carbons. So that means there's no space for any extra hydrogens. Um, where this becomes a problem sometimes is let's say I ask you in a question to draw a structure that is C4H, the formula C4H8. And you go, oh, okay, four hydro or four carbons. So one, two, three, four, C4H8. Well, it's actually not if we count the hydrogens out properly, because we've got three hydrogens here, two there, two there, and three there. So CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. So the structure I've drawn is actually C4H10 which is not what was asked for. So to get to those eight hydrogens, we'd have to um, do something else, which we'll get into later, like put in a double bond, so that it's actually C4H8. And then the third rule, the last rule, is other atoms whatever, O, N, whatever it might be, are 
are left alone, unabbreviated, and they're attached hydrogens are always shown. So if I'm trying to abbreviate something like the molecules later, where we have what's called a functional group, these non-carbon things like an OH. When we make a line structure of that, we got to make sure to leave the OH intact. So we go one, two, three for three carbons, and then one more line, and we put the OH at the end there. And that also means that there are no carbons at that spot. We've got our one, two, three carbons, one, two, three, and then the OH connected there. So it's important to remember that the O and the H stay there. If you want to draw a line structure of a, of a molecule with the OH, you don't take the H off. And the reason for that is because other atoms aren't as predictable as carbon. Oxygen can have no hydrogens on it. It can have one hydrogen. It can have two hydrogens. Nitrogen, same thing. So we have to specify that to make sure that we know um, what we're talking about. All right, and that's how to draw line structures. So um, I don't know. What do you want to do? Do you want to have a quiz next Monday on this or no? Or should we do one? We could do an extra one. The last week of class is kind of a final exam review thing. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do that. So no quiz next Monday. Well, next Monday will be all of the rest of the organic stuff before the exam. Um, so that'll be a lot. And then we'll do a quiz on Monday before the exam. Exam Wednesday. And then we'll fit two quizzes in the week after the last week of our class. Monday and Wednesday. All right. Chris, good. Okay. Um, thanks for this quick change of schedule tonight with the lab, but that's done. So on Wednesday, we're going to do lab 12, um, the very last lab, the organic molecules to so bring that stuff in. This, um, uh, this lab will be due, if you want to turn it into a nuclear lab, please turn it in next week sometime. Um, so I guess Monday, because we don't have class. I don't care. Next week or the week after, doesn't really matter. Um, I just want to make sure you have time to get them all done before the end of class. So um, get these in the next couple of weeks. You got the pre-lab for you there? Okay, thanks. If you haven't done that, you can just do it with the lab report. Thanks, everybody. Uh, see you Wednesday.